Good evening and welcome to part two of Babylon has fallen, come out of her my people. It's not my desire to be a wet rag. It's not my desire to depress you or cause you anxiety. It is not my desire to grieve you or make you angry. Because I was angry and I was grieved <laughs> and I was upset to learn the truth, but I'm trying to help you get free. I'm trying to help you get yourself ready for the very soon and imminent return of Jesus Christ to claim his people, to claim his bride, and for the judgment and doom and destruction of Babylon. And these events coincide very close together. So if you're going to prepare yourself for one event, you have to also prepare yourself for the other. Come out of her. Come out of her, my people. I don't even like doing videos this serious. I'm not prophetic. I'm not serious. I, I like to tell jokes and make people laugh. I mean, you know, tonight I had to beg Jesus for some time off because I was just so bummed out doing the study. I'm like, Jesus, I, I, I would just sit on the bed depressed and procrastinate for hours and stare at the ceiling and be like, Jesus, I don't want to do this. I don't want to make this video. I don't want to say these things. I don't want to do this research. I don't want to watch these videos. <laughs> um... Just to summarize what we talked about last time, we, we looked at all of the many clues in Revelation. Well, not even all of them, just some of the many clues. And we were comparing them to different organizations and entities, but one of the things we noticed, Revelation 17 tells us, the waters you saw, right? Babylon the harlot, she sits on many waters. They are many peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So whoever Babylon is, the new Babylon, She's composed of many people, multitudes, nations, and languages. She's a pluralistic society. She is an organization that is very uh, heterogeneous. She's not a homogenous nation like most other nations on earth. Every other nation generally began uh, and are populated by an indigenous population. You know, they're all of particularly the same race and color and culture and ethnicity, things like that, culture. But Babylon is different. Babylon is a great melting pot, okay? She's clay mixed in with iron and all these other things together. And uh, you know, she's composed of many peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So that's one clue. And then we talked about the beast and then the seven horns and the ten horns. And... Revelation tells us they're kings. Kings preside over kingdoms, and those are nations. So we are talking about geopolitical power. And this harlot, she rides the beast and the horns on the beast. So she manipulates, she controls right now the beast and, and makes the beast do her bidding. However, they will come to resent her. They will come to hate her because she manipulates and controls him. And then they will bring her to ruin, leave her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose. But for, you know, for a time, she rules over the kings of the earth. Okay, what's another clue? In her heart, she boasts. She says, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her death, mourning, and famine, she will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So uh, an aspect of Babylon is she's an arrogant woman. She's a prideful woman. She says she is enthroned as queen. She will never mourn. She has false confidence in herself. She trusts in her military. She trusts in her soldiers. She trusts in, you know, all of these things that are not God, that are not repentance. Um... So that's that's another sign, you know. She she thinks that no evil will ever befall her. She thinks that she's invincible, you know. She's like Superwoman, and nobody can touch her, and you know, no disaster will ever strike her. And uh, another clue: the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. So she is an organization, a nation, an entity that imports. A huge number of goods, okay? She's 
the, the entire world is made rich off of selling their products to her and selling their services to her. And because she buys them, she literally supports the economy of the earth. And when Babylon goes down, the entire economy of the earth is going to crash and burn with her because she's right now the one who's predominantly buying all the world's goods and services. And when she's destroyed, who's going to buy the world's goods and services? Along with her, the economies of all the other nations will also be destroyed. And notice it says here in Revelation 18, 11 through 16, and human beings sold as slaves. So whoever Babylon is, she's an entity who has been involved with slavery and involved in slavery. And then we're told in, in chapter 18, verse 17, in one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Okay, and the merchants of the earth will weep and wail because of her. In one hour, hour, she will be brought to ruin. She will be destroyed when they see the smoke of her burning. Okay, her judgment is by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So those are just some of the clues of Babylon that we see. Many of you probably know who Jonathan Kahn is, and if not, he is a messianic or completed Jew. So he's a Jew who believes that Jesus Christ is his Messiah, and uh, he's a great teacher and rabbi, and he wrote a book called The Harbinger. And it was a prophetic book where he talked about the events of September 11th, what happened in America and Babylon, and how it was a harbinger uh, of things to come, okay? You know, so it, it was prophetic, a series of prophetic events. And one of the things that Jonathan Kahn talks about is the Isaiah 9:10 judgment, okay? And uh, I'm just going to let you guys listen to it in his own words, so... tree crashes. What kind of tree is it? It was a sycamore. The sign of national judgment, the sycamore has fallen right in order. And just like the other harbingers, the people make it into a symbol. They take the fallen sycamore and they put it on display and they call it the sycamore of ground zero. They celebrate the sycamore. New Yorkers come to see the sycamore without realizing that it is an ancient harbinger of judgment. Okay, so you understand that's prophetic, right? The sycamore tree that's there at ground zero, <laughs> that's actually a prophetic instrument, all right? The harbinger of the sycamore appears in America, the sign of uprooting for a nation, the sixth harbinger. The vow continues. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will plant cedars in their place. This is another vow of defiance. See, the natural thing would have been to replace an old sycamore with a new sycamore, but they don't do that. The sycamore was a plain tree, was uh, an even weak tree. The people of Israel clear away the fallen sycamores. They go to, the, to plant a cedar in the place, in the exact place where the sycamore has stood. Okay, so you understand that everything that he's saying, that he's reading, he's reading out of scripture that was like three, four thousand years ago. <laughs> and yet, prophetically, it all happened again. As, as it happened with Israel, it also happened with America, with Babylon. Now, what tree is it? Now, when you read in English, you read cedar. But behind that is a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is Erez, or the Erez tree. Erez can mean cedar, but it, it specifically means more than cedar. It, it, all, it means a, a conifer tree or a coniferous tree, an evergreen conifer tree, a, a tree with, uh, with pines or needle-like leaves. But most specifically, the most accurate translation of Erez, we will, we will plant an Erez tree, the most accurate translation is the word panacea, a panacea tree, a tree of the panacea family. What they're saying is that we're going to come back stronger. We're going to plant a stronger tree. The cedar was a much stronger tree to represent that we will not be uprooted, but we're going to come back again stronger. We're going to bloom. We're going to prosper like a tree. We're going to grow taller. So it becomes another symbol of the nation and of its defiance against God. Again, trying to rebuild and become great again, but without true repentance. That is the 
the very nature of Make America Great Again, if you think about it. It's this nostalgic longing for the golden years, the good old days, but, but without any true repentance, okay? I mean, obviously we know the left is corrupt, but now you're seeing the corruption in the right, okay? Um, I've showed video clips before of like, you know, 30, 40 Republican politicians caught in acts of homosexuality and adultery and fornication. You know, some of them having sex right there in their offices in Congress. And these are Republicans, not Democrats. We know that the Democrats and the you know liberals don't follow God. We know that. But the problem is the hypocrisy of the right. The Republicans claim to be God's chosen. You know, the Grand Old Party, GOP, sometimes they, they think of themselves as God's own party, but but it's utter hypocrisy. It's the yeast of the Pharisees because we see that the right is just as depraved as the left. And yet, hypocritically, they're claiming to be uh, servants of the Most High God. They, they, they claim to, you know, they're the ones who adulterously mixed their politics with the pure holy gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they became the wine of fornication and adultery in the cup of the harlot. And uh, I mean, in the last month, I think I've seen three or four of these Republican politicians, they've committed suicide because they've been caught in sexual immorality, infidelity, sexual harassment, and they committed suicide rather than, than face the shame, you know, face the public in, in shame of, of what they had done. So this whole idea of America, of Babylon becoming great again, without coming to God, without repenting, it's part of her false confidence. She says, I sit as queen, I sit enthroned, and I will never know sorrow. And I will never know disaster. I will never know catastrophe. You know, she believes in her military might that she's the most powerful nation on earth and no one will ever be able to judge her. No one will ever bring her to ruin. You know, who could even stand up to her? Because, you know, she goes over and she topples these regimes who are not as big as one of her 50 states. And so she vastly outnumbers them in population and in power and in riches and resources and military might. But, but what happens when a formidable foe when a worthy opponent comes against Babylon. You know, her false confidence won't save her. Could this happen, would this happen in America, the seventh harbinger to be manifested? As we saw in the wake of 9-11, a sycamore was struck down. But now the people of America or New York have to replace that tree, not with a sycamore, which would be natural, but with a different tree. And that tree has to be a, a Hebrew Erez tree. Could that have happened? Well, an amazing thing. Three years later, after 9-11, uh, a sign, a tree appears in the sky on a crane being lowered over a, a fence at the corner of ground zero, it's lowered into the exact spot where once stood a sycamore tree. What is that tree? That tree, the eris tree has to be a conifer. The tree is a conifer. The eris tree is specifically a panacea tree. The tree that they chose to replace the sycamore of ground zero was a panacea tree, which is the biblical eris tree. And just as with the other harbingers, they have a ceremony around the tree, and they, they gather around it, and they proclaim this is the tree of hope, just like the tree of Israel's planting was their tree of their national hope. Uh, they celebrate the defiant nature of human hope, and they declare it, this is, the, this is now the ground zero tree of hope, And it, the, the one who, who officiates over the ceremony literally makes reference to this act. And the, in Hebrew, the act is called chalaf. It means we replace or plant in the place of another. It says, this new, this tree of hope is, is planted in the exact spot, he proclaims, where the sycamore once stood. And this is all taking place in the corner of ground zero. All these things manifesting the sixth and seventh harbinger together, and nobody is planning this out. Nobody is is figuring it out. Nobody's saying let's do this with this. It's just happening. As with the rest of the harbingers, they happen because they have to happen. They have to be manifested. So now 
in order even the seventh harbinger is manifested at the corner of ground zero. Our confidence shaken. Though we are living through difficult and uncertain times, Okay, now, the eighth harbinger is the utterance. In this case, again, three, four thousand years later in Babylon and America, they repeat the exact same sin, the exact same mistake that Israel did. All right, they, they didn't truly repent. They said, we're going to come back. We're going we're gonna to make ourselves great again. We're going to rebuild. We're going to, you know, but it wasn't true repentance. All throughout the land, their leaders were still corrupt and they were still worshiping Baal. Nobody was upright. Nobody, you know, even the ones who claimed to stand for truth and who claimed to be righteous weren't. It was it was like a, a Pharisee, Sadducee kind of righteousness. You know, on the outside clean and white, but on the inside full of dead men's bones, people who strain at gnats but swallow camels, that sort of thing. And this eighth harbinger, the utterance, they actually fulfill prophecy by prophetically speaking God's word all over again. Over Babylon. The eighth harbinger is the utterance, is the vow of defiance that Israel utters to, against God after the strike in connection with that strike. We're seeing that the harbingers actually determine not only the actions of people, the actions of American leaders, but also the actual words. And the people may have said that vow, we will rebuild, we will plant, we'll come back stronger. The people may have said that, but, but the leaders had to have said it, because it's only significant if the leaders say it, because the leaders determine the course of the nation. The leaders represent the nation. So the leaders would have to make the vow, and they're the only ones who really could authoritatively make it, we will rebuild, and let me just say the vow again, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with quarried stone. The Sycamores have been struck down, but we will plant cedars in their place. And where would they have proclaimed it? The leaders would have proclaimed it in the capital city, because that's where they resided, in Samaria. So, for the eighth harbinger to manifest in America, what has to happen is that an American leader, or a prominent American leader, would have to proclaim these words of defiance in a public setting in the capital city. Now, could this happen? Because what American leader in their right mind would be proclaiming a verse of judgment on the nation? Well, the amazing thing is, it happened. It would have to be linked to 9-11 because the, the words are linked to the strike of ancient Israel. So it has to be, happen in the Capitol, has to happen in Washington, D.C. So he gets up to speak, and he has no idea what he's about to do. These are his actual words. He says this, Good morning. Today, on this day of remembrance and mourning, we have the Lord's word to get us through. And these are the words. The bricks have fallen but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. Out of some 30,000 verses in the Bible he thought would be inspiring to his audience, he chooses the one verse that's about the judgment of a nation that has just received the first strike and the first warning to speak to commemorate 9-11. And not only does he say this, but he builds his entire speech around the ancient vow. His whole speech is a manifestation of the vow. He goes on to say this, let me show you how we are building and putting cedars in those three hallowed places. He goes on, and in a place where smoke once rose, you and I, we will see that cedar rising. And he says yet again, and you'll see that while those bricks fell and the sycamores cut down, our people, our people, are making the cedars rise. It's mind-boggling. It's amazing that he would say this. 
He doesn't realize because no one would say this if they knew what it was. And so he's speaking allegorically. He speaks of cedars and, and sycamores and stones as if it was not a nice poetic symbol of America's restoration. He has no idea that there is an actual cedar or Erez tree that our people made rise. He has no idea that there's an actual a sycamore tree that actually was struck down. He has no idea there's an actual Gazit stone that we actually put up. Yet he proclaims it without knowing it. He is uttering the vow, and he's now making the ancient vow. He's transforming it now into America's vow, which is ominous because that vow was sealing the fate of ancient Israel for destruction. So the eighth harbinger, the vow, the utterance, is manifested in Washington, D.C. So we look at the seventh and eighth harbingers of Babylon's doom. Now the ninth harbinger. ninth harbinger is the vow in the form of prophecy or the prophecy that in other words the vow the ancient vow is to be proclaimed in america by an american leader in the capital city and it's proclaimed prophetically in advance of what is about to happen it's going to foretell the course of america before it happens and it's going to become part of the national record But there's more to it, because the vow of the ancient leaders of Israel was also prophetic, because they were speaking what would happen. They were foretelling the nation's course of defiance and judgment, and it becomes part of the prophetic record of the Bible, because Isaiah quotes it as a comment on it from God's judgment on the vow, so it also becomes a prophetic utterance in that respect. What leader in their right mind would do this, proclaiming judgment on America? But the amazing thing is, it happened. On the day after 9-11, in the Capitol City, on Capitol Hill, a national leader, a, a very high national leader, the Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle, he is the one who's appointed to bring America's response to 9-11. So this is prophetically important. This is going to be the nation's response to 9-11. And he's representing the Senate. The Senate is representing the people. And so he is especially appointed to bear this word. And so he comes up to present the response of the nation to 9-11. And he gives a speech. A symbol for 212 years of the strength of our democracy. And say that America will emerge from this tragedy as we have emerged from all adversity, united and strong. And what he does at the end of the speech was ominous. I know that there is only the smallest measure of inspiration of that can be taken from this devastation. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. What is it? Then he proclaims it from Capitol Hill. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. So, can we Here is the man appointed to give the nation's a response How about, speaking in his capacity we will make representing America the nation. Great again. He utters the words of ancient Israel. And he closes the speech with these words. He says this. That is what we will do. We will rebuild and we will recover. That is what we will do. We will make America great again. That is what we will do. He's referring to Isaiah 9.10. He just said it. So what, this is mind-boggling. What he's saying is America's policy now, America's course will be Isaiah 9.10. And this is prophetic in so many ways. First of all, he doesn't even know when he says this, he says the sycamores have been cut. He doesn't know that it actually happened the, on ground zero. The dust was still hovering over ground zero when they were discovering it as he was speaking. 
He doesn't know that there will actually be a stone that he proclaims a stone will be laid at ground zero three years later. Now, I want you to listen to what Rudy Giuliani says. And then Donald Trump speaks after him. Listen to what Donald Trump says. We had no idea at the time when this was being recorded that he was going to be president number 45. So pay attention to Donald J. Trump's words. It is God's will that he became our 45th president. God engineered that entire election. Nobody thought he would win. You know, everybody predicted Hillary would win. But with God's help, with God's blessing, with God's providence, Donald J. Trump won the election last year. Uh, But it wasn't to save America. It was not to make America great again. Donald Trump is an instrument of judgment in God's hands. He is a judgment against Babylon. And his purpose was to divide her as a kingdom against herself. He's part of the judgment that weakens and ultimately brings about the destruction of Babylon, who invites her enemies and her rivals to rise up against her. So listen, listen to his words. We're going to rebuild. We're not only going to rebuild, we're going to come out of this stronger than we were before. They should rebuild the World Trade Center, but make them stronger and maybe a story taller. And then we've won the battle. Because this is the official response of America to 9-11, and that actual response is Isaiah 9-10. It's in the Senate record. It is the, the ancient vow. How could this possibly become our response? It happened because it had to happen. The harbinger had to manifest, and so it did on the very day after the calamity, the ninth harbinger, all nine harbingers manifested in precision, in exactness, harbingers of judgment. Okay, so again, um, these harbingers, and and I highly recommend reading his book, if you haven't already, Uh, it's called The Harbinger, but uh, just just amazing work of prophetic revelation by this this disredeemed messianic Jewish rabbi. And uh, so... um, Again, if you look at the clues, look at the clues in Revelation, in the book of Daniel, in the book of Isaiah, (laughs) the harbingers, what organization, what entity, what nation do they all seem to fit? There are so many massive clues about who Babylon is and the ultimate fate of the United States of America. If you open your eyes to see, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Did you know that Baal, remember we said that one of the root words uh, for Babylon, it's, you know, in Babylonian, it's gateway of the gods, but in Hebrew, it was for confusion. And it was from Baal, and Baal was a a, a demonic false god, a a deity that they worshipped. And as part of their act of worship, they would take like their firstborn, their children, and they would kill them. They would, you know, they would pass them through the fire. And sometimes they would they would bury them. They would put them in a clay jar and, and kill them. And, and that was supposed to be like a cornerstone for a home and, and bring blessing on it. It was an abomination. But there was this demonic ritual of killing, people killing their own children and offering them as a sacrifice to Baal. And what do you think Babylon does with the killing of the unborn, right? With abortion, with we're, we're literally sacrificing our own children, up on the altar of Baal. And they actually took the gate of Baal and erected it in New York City. Did you know that? Did you know that? The gate of Baal was resurrected in the United States of America in New York City. Okay? The arch from Palmyra erected in New York City led to the Temple of Baal. It stood between the two major, right, almost right, almost exactly in the middle, of the two great temples of Baal. Both both of them were destroyed last year by ISIS. The arch is an act of defiance to rebuild, standing for the destroyed arch and the temples. A fallen icon, a temple. It actually, you know, there's no, the temple of Baal Shamim is gone. The temple of, it's a temple of culture. It stood, it's now in ruins. Show the net, I'm going to show you kind of like a satellite picture of the ruins. That's where the temple of Baal Shamim was. I was led to do something. 
Since we were erecting, we were, they were erecting the arch from Palmyra in, in New York City, what would happen if we transposed ancient Palmyra onto New York City? Based on where they put the arch, its location, its orientation, its angle, and by that, that it, it pointed to the Temple of Baal in Palmyra. So I asked Scott Pinto to trace it out, get the exact distance, his exact feet. He did so on the satellite, did so on maps, and the exact orientation of the angle, relative angles, distance to the Temple of Baal, or Baal Shemayim, Shemim. Where the Temple of Baal, or the ruins of the Temple of Baal is now, it's a place of fallen buildings. So we were down there. We charted out. He charted on the map, followed it. Where did we end up? Where did the arch point to where the Temple of Baal would be? It was in New York City, stood on the ground, where the Temple of Baal ruins, destroyed buildings were. I want you to see the next one. And this is it. It leads to ground zero. We went by the exact feet. It leads to the destruction of America's temple. It leads to the place where the harbingers appeared. It leads to the place where they said, we will rebuild. It leads to the place where terrorists attacked. What was done there, and we said, we will rebuild in defiance. And there, we will make America there, great again. Where it all in began. In defiance. Where it all began. It was actually 1,259 feet to find it. And that's where we ended up exactly to ground zero. So the resurrected gate of Baal, the demonic false god of Baal, to whom children are sacrificed as we sacrifice our own born in Babylon, it is erected in the very site where the harbingers took place that were foreshadowing the judgment of God upon the nation of Babylon, Mystery the Great. This is Jonathan Kahn, the author of The Harbinger, standing in New York City. And we're about to see a, another manifestation, a harbinger of where we are, where we are heading. In the book, The Harbinger, it opens up the mystery of the last days of ancient Israel. Israel was a nation that had known God, was founded by God and on his word, but in their prosperity, the people turned away from God. They turned away from the God of their foundation. And they turned to the God Baal. And, and they offered up their children as sacrifices on the altars of Baal. They called what was evil good and what was good evil. They drove God out of their government, out of their culture, out of, out of their, the lives of their children. They now, I want to point something out. There's been this fake, false revival. Okay, they've even tried to like overturn the Johnson Act, the Lyndon Johnson Act, so that, that, you know, churches can now preach partisan politics from their pulpits, which is an abomination in the eyes of God. You should never take the holy gospel of Jesus Christ that he gave his life for that cost him everything and mix it with the abomination of Democrat or Libertarian or Republican politics. May it never be. And yet, I want you to understand this idea of make America, it's make America great again. It's a false revival. It's a form of Christianity with no Christ. It's a godliness with no God in it, a godliness with no power. And the Bible says from such turn away, okay? There's been no true repentance. Even the, the you know, number 45, the president there, Donald J. Trump, he's not a moral man. Look at his character. Look at the nature of his character. Whenever somebody opposes him, he, he doesn't love his enemies and bless those who curse him and pray for those who use him. He attacks them fiercely, vindictively, ferociously, okay? Um, is, is he someone who, who has childlike innocence, like in Matthew 18, 4, who humbles himself as a child? No, he's full of pride and full of arrogance. He's always tooting his own horn and always talking about he's the best and the greatest at everything. Um, you know, is he... Somebody who respects women, does he have regard for women? No, he has no regard for women at all. He's divorced and, and, and married three times, and he's been adulterous. He hasn't been faithful in his marriages. He is lewd. He's been accused of many of being a sexual predator 
and he brags about grabbing women by their private parts and you know um he bragged that he could shoot someone on fifth avenue and his followers would still follow him that he could get away with murder are these the sort of things that jesus would do is this the character of christ when they asked him if he needed god's forgiveness he said that he went to church and he loved the bible in addition to loving his own book, The Art of the Deal, he sort of put them on the same level with each other. And then he said he didn't believe he needed God's forgiveness. He just tries to make things right whenever he does something wrong. Okay, but that shows he has no real understanding of the grace of God or of the gospel. If he can't come out and, 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 and humbly and brokenly admit he's a sinner, hopelessly lost in depravity and, 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 and worthy and bound for hell without the grace of God, that he doesn't really understand the gospel at all. And, and yet, we think that because number 45 is in office and make America great again, and because all of these false prophets and religious leaders have gathered around him to suck up to him because they're attracted to his money and his power, they're sycophants, they're suck-ups, they're not real prophets at all. Remember real prophets like Nathan who went to David and, and he, had, you know, he confronted David. He convicted David of, of murder and adultery and lying to God. Look at other prophets like, you know, Isaiah and, you know, um, and Elijah. They, they were thrown into prison and, and you know, Jezebel and, and you know, they, the kings of Israel did horrible things to them because they didn't suck up to them. They didn't, they didn't blow smoke up their behind and tell them whatever they wanted to hear to court their favor and money and power. They brought them the unpopular word of the Lord. All right? Those were real prophets. They had cojones, okay? The prophets today congregating around Donald Trump who are too afraid to tell him the truth and he do nothing but blow smoke up his behind and tell him what he wants to hear. Those aren't real prophets. They're just suck-ups who prophesy for money. They're just, they're just people who want his money and power. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is this, this revival that we think we had, it was a false revival. There never really was a revival. There never really was repentance. There never really was make America great again. It was all talk. It was all smoke screens. It was all illusions. Okay? And here's the, the, the sad thing is, is that... Christians were so afraid of the left, they were so afraid of liberals, they didn't understand and th th that they ran straight into the arms of, of, of the right, of right-wing politics and the Republicans, and, and they didn't understand that they were literally running to the other side of the coin, that the enemy owns both sides, the Democrats and the Republicans, the liberals and the conservatives. Satan owns it all. He's playing it like a game, and they don't they don't understand that and it's like it's like they were just totally blindsided by this okay i mean all these people who claim to be republicans and and yet dozens upon dozens upon dozens of them caught in sexual immorality and adultery and homosexuality and fornication and pornography and in murder and embezzling money and these are the ones who claim to be the teachers and the preachers and and, and the right you know they're just as bad as the left, even more depraved, because of the hypocrisy, them claiming to be God's chosen ones. And I, you have to understand, you can't put faith in this fake revival. There never was a real revival. That was a great deception of Satan to fool you. There never was a true repentance in Babylon in America. America today, even under number 45, even under Make America Great Again, she's still as unrepentant as she was two years ago. There's no change. And there's no change in God's judgment. It is written. They persecuted and hunted down the righteous. And they did this all as they worshiped Baal. And the harbinger reveals the nine signs or harbingers that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel and that those same signs, harbingers, are now appearing on American soil. Some of them, many of them, right here in New York City, some in Washington, D.C., but here we are in the city of most of the harbingers, starting with 9-11 and the attack on America. Now, one of the things about the template of the harbinger is that when the first warnings came, when the warning came to ancient Israel, they ignored them and they got even worse. They departed even more brazenly against the ways of God. They made the 
the vow, the declaration that Isaiah recorded, Isaiah 9:10, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will plant cedars in their place. So they're saying we're gonna get worse, we're gonna, we're gonna come back greater, but without you, God. So spiritually, they were gonna descend even worse and worse and worse. And that's exactly the template that we are seeing in America. Since 9-11, we are following, we have followed the template of ancient Israel, not only with the harbingers appearing, but with increasing defiance, increasing the calling of evil good and good evil, increasing in every way immorality. And when the judgment finally came, after the warning, years later, the judgment came to ancient Israel, the people of Israel were worshiping Baal. Now Baal is, the real name was Baal, it means Lord or Master. Baal was the substitute God. He was the God of their apostasy. He was the God that they turned to when they turned away from the God of their fathers. That's Babylon's God, the God of Baal, the God to whom she sacrifices her unborn to and her children to. Baal was the anti-God, or the representing their fall. America has followed that pattern. The harbingers have appeared. Could the sign of Baal appear in the land? Could the sign of Baal, the sign of a nation that has turned away from God, a nation that has embarked on defiance of God and judgment, could that sign appear in this land? And we are here today to witness that sign appearing on American soil. And it is September 19th, 2016. I'm standing in New York City, in City Hall Park, on a rainy Monday afternoon, a little past one. And what you see in back of me, about to be unveiled, covered up, is the arch that led to the Temple of Baal. In a moment, they're gonna have a ceremony, they're gonna unveil it, and There'll be American leaders here, and what you will see on American soil is the sign of Baal. understand the significance of this, my friend. The Arch of Baal is here in America, in Babylon, in our land, erected, standing. soil in back of me is the manifesting of the sign of Baal. This is a reproduction of the arch that stood in Syria that led to the temple of Baal, the arch through which the worshipers of Baal would go to worship their God, the God of Israel's apostasy. Baal in America the God that is there at the time of the harbingers, the time of judgment, this is the sign, this is what led to, and this is what an, a sign of a nation that is leading to judgment. Baal, the sign of a nation that departed from its God. Baal, the sign of a nation in apostasy from God. Baal, the sign of a nation that once knew good and evil, and now calls evil good and good evil. Baal, the sign of a nation that offers its children as sacrifices. Baal, 
the sign of a nation that persecutes the followers of God. And now, September 2016, this harbinger has appeared to America. Jesus told his disciples, his followers, the church, the bride of Christ, you are a city on a hill. He called them a city on a hill. Okay? And he said they were the light of the world because he's the light of the world and he was in them. So that title, when Jesus spoke that, that was meant, you know, he's the light of the world who dwells in his people. He dwells in his followers, his disciples, his church, his bride. And the city on the hill is his bride. That title is only for him and his bride. It was never meant to belong to a nation. And I want you to understand that blasphemously, I said that right, <laughs> In a blasphemous way, um, our political leaders have taken that title and ascribed it instead unto Babylon, unto America. I've spoken of a shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace. Babylon. A city with free ports that hung with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? More prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow is held steady, no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. We've done our part, and as I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan Revolution, the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. Now, I love Ronald Reagan. He was one of my favorite presidents. Um, when he was president, that's when the wall came down between East and West Germany. And I was actually over in Europe at the time. I remember they were selling pieces of the wall. You could buy a little piece of the wall. <laughs> so I, I was in awe of Ronald Reagan. It was like, wow, this is the man who won the Cold War. This is the man who, you know, wow, he brought America victory. But I want you to understand that describing America as a city on the hill, that, that is praise that does not belong to America. That is praise that only belongs to the city of God, to God's people, to the church, to New Jerusalem, okay? You're taking something that God meant for one thing and you're trying to use it for another. You're trying to glorify it and, 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 and almost deify it. And also notice in his praise of America, he referred to it as a great city. The great Babylon, the great Babylon is a great city, right? So everything that he, Ronald Reagan said was symbolic of Babylon. And just, just another example, somebody, you know, praising America as the light of the world. But America is not the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. The winds of change have come around in every city, every town. Now I'm all for patriotism. A little piece of innocence but is gone. Again, you. But what we got. You can't take something that God meant that for for his own people and for his son Jesus. You can't take something holy like that and give it away to a nation it doesn't belong to. Now when you see that flag, it makes the hair stand up on your arm, doesn't it? The hair stands up on my arm. Every time I hear the Star Spangled Banner, every time I see the Pledge of Allegiance, the light of the world. Okay, sure, I 
feel it too, but that is singing praise to America and not to God. Do you understand? That is glorifying a corrupt man-made country and not God, not Jesus. Do, do you hear you understand this song? We've never known any fear. But what is happening right here is the ultimate test of our resolve. We survived the civil war. It's funny because even though I know, even though I know that this is tantamount to blasphemy because we're taking the praise that belongs to the one true king and to the one true God and, and we're giving it to Babylon, to a nation, even though I know that, I still can't help but feel moved by the song because like you, I grew up loving this nation. You know, it still makes the hair stand up on my arm. Even though I know that it's wrong that, that the title, Light of the World, does not belong to America. I listen to this song and, and I'm moved by it. it. It stirs my patriotism. So I want you to understand that it's not easy to come out of Babylon. I get it. We grew up in her. Ever since we could speak, we were taught that she's God's chosen, that she's the light of the world, that, that she's the city on a hill, that... We have equated her and put her on par with God, you know? Some of you criticize the Catholic Church because they take Mary and they call her the mother of God and, and they put her on par or equal with Jesus or God. And yet you'll turn right around and worship the flag and worship the United States of America as though she were not going to be destroyed, as though somehow you were going to be able to take that American flag to heaven with you. Or you're going to be able to take, you know, I'm sorry, but where we're going, the only kingdom left standing is Jesus' kingdom. And the only king left standing is Jesus. All other nations are destroyed and they will fall. And all other kings will be torn down off their thrones and deposed. And Jesus will be the last king standing. He is the light of the world. When he lives in us, and we shine as light, we can be the light of the world. But Babylon, or a nation, cannot be the light of the world. That is blasphemy. That is falsehood. That is a delusion and a deception that will lead you astray. That's why we get involved. Don't let the flame die out. That's what a man And I'm still stirred, listening to his words and looking at that flag, the hair on my arm is standing up. I want to snap my heels together and say the pledge. Even though I know this song is wrong, I'm still moved by it. Do you understand? Even though I'm trying to tell you <laughs> that calling America the light of the world and a city on a hill is, is, is something blasphemous. I can't help, my, my, my carnal flesh is still moved to patriotism and watching this video and listening to the song. So I understand the delusion is strong. The deception is strong. But God says, come out of her, my people. Come out of her. So we've talked about it a lot and I was only going to do this in two parts. But I think I'm going to have to do maybe four parts because there's still a lot we haven't covered and it's just too much to put. Uh, I'm going to have to break this up into chunks and pieces to make it more digestible. But um, look, I'm, I, feel, I feel your, your discomfort and I feel your pain. If that's what you're experiencing right now. I, I too grew up in Babylon. I too was taught since the day... I, I can understand speech, that she was God's chosen. I, too, love this country. I mean, it's one of the richest, most powerful, most wonderful countries on earth. We have enjoyed freedom here, freedom from 
persecution, freedom from fear, freedom from hunger, freedom from famine, freedom from plagues. We have grown up and live in a soft, cushy life where even our poor have more than some of the wealthy do in countries less fortunate. And I praise God for all the blessings bestowed upon America, but, you know, her, her days are numbered, just like every other nation. Every nation on earth, their days are all numbered, and they will not stand. And we have to say goodbye to them all. If I don't care if you live in the UK. I don't care if you live in America. I don't care if you live in India. I don't care if you live in China. Understand that your culture, your nation, um, the entire world that you grew up in will be utterly annihilated and destroyed. And understand that you are no longer of this world. You're no longer a citizen of China or the UK or America or India or Pakistan or <laughs> Brazil. No, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. You're not even of this world anymore. You belong to the kingdom of God. That is where you're going. That is to whom you will belong. You are no longer a nation composed of people bound by geographical boundaries. You are a nation composed of people all over the entire world, of every tribe and tongue and kindred and clan and language and race and ethnicity and persuasion. And that is who you are, family of God. New Jerusalem, you know, you are the kingdom of God. You, you are the kingdom of God being given birth. So, I, I hope this helps you get free. If you have been entangled in the deception of worshiping Babylon, of, of, of being caught up in, in, in the worship of, of a, a nation doomed to destruction, I pray this helps you set yourself free from her. Knowing that our time is short and knowing that she is doomed, what sort of life ought you to live? Come out of her. Come out of her. For her doom has almost come. Mighty is the Lord God who judges her. In the next two videos, which I hadn't even planned on doing, I'm going to talk about some other things. Um, did you know? Did you know that everything we were taught about the origin of America, of Babylon, at least everything that I was taught, I have discovered was a falsehood. Uh, it really burst my bubble. I almost cried. I had all these childhood heroes. You know, our founding fathers. I thought they were good, godly men. And yet, after doing the research, I, I find out they were theists and atheists and involved in the occult. And <laughs> it is disheartening. It is disillusioning. It, it, it made me depressed. It made me feel like curling up into a ball in a fetal position and just crying and staring at the wall. All these people who I had lifted up on a pedestal, they were my heroes, our founding fathers. Well, I... I found out they're not who I thought they were. And, I mean, we're all human, we're all flawed, but you just wouldn't believe the falsehoods we have been taught most of our lives. It's not my desire to be a wet rag. It's not my desire to depress you or cause you anxiety. It is not my desire to grieve you or make you angry. Because I was angry, and I was grieved, and, <laughs> and I was upset to learn the truth, but I'm trying to help you get free. I'm trying to help you get yourself ready for the very soon and imminent return of Jesus Christ to claim his people, to claim his bride, and for the judgment and doom and destruction of Babylon. And these events coincide very close together. So if you're going to prepare yourself for one event, you have to also prepare yourself for the other. Come out of her. Come out of her, my people. I don't even like doing videos this serious. I'm not prophetic. I'm not serious. I, I like to tell jokes and make people laugh. I mean, you know, tonight 
I had to beg Jesus for some time off because I was just so bummed out doing the study. I'm like, Jesus, I, I, I would just sit on the bed depressed and procrastinate for hours and stare at the ceiling and be like, Jesus, I don't want to do this. I don't want to make this video. I don't want to say these things. I don't want to do this research. I don't want to watch these videos. <laughs> and I played the I played this song by Tracy Ullman, They Don't Know. <laughs> and it really lifted my spirit. It's a worship song. I think I'm going to do it as a worship song. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll do a video on it. But it, the words are perfect because, you know, all around the world, every atheists tell us, you know, we're crazy because we believe in Jesus. We believe in a God who isn't real because you know, he's invisible and they can't see him. And if you listen to the words of that old Tracy Ullman song, they don't know. It's it's a love song. It's like a 1950s style love song that she redid in the 80s. They played it at my, my high school prom. But, but it's so cool because it's what the bride of Christ can sing to her groom, Jesus. You know, the the words are just amazing. And uh, I'll I'll share that, but but I you know it's I, I'm just glad Jesus let me do that just to kind of give me a break, so that I could be lighthearted, and and do something fun and and, and 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 something musical and something that I enjoy. That's something I actually enjoy. Believe it or not, making videos like this, I don't enjoy it. I hate it. I, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. It's excruciating, but yet I feel like. I had to be obedient. I, I did this because I felt like Jesus commanded me to. He's, he's, like, he's like, Carly, I want you to share this with people. I want you to help people become unentangled from Babylon. To, I want you to help people to become, to, to uninvest themselves from her politics and her culture and to prepare because I'm coming soon to claim my bride. And in that process, Around the same time, Babylon's judgment is coming as well. Again, if you're going to prepare for the return of Jesus, you also need to prepare for the judgment of Babylon. To prepare for one is to prepare for the other. They're related. So, I guess I'll do two more videos. <laughs> I'll be so glad when we're done with this study. <laughs> oh... I believe it's the will of God. I believe I'm being obedient, but it is just not something I've, it's just, it's kind of bummed me out, you know? I love America. It's brought tears to my eyes and heaviness to my heart. But Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So uh, maybe two more and then hopefully we can go back to the musical dog and pony show. Yay! <laughs> Good night, my sisters and brothers, my fellow brides. I love you all so much. I hope I see you in the air. Hugs and kisses. Mwah.